Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Town Talks on December 2nd, 2020. I'm Newell Arnerich, Mayor of Danville. Delighted to be here with a very close friend and a special guest who all of us know, not only because of her current role as Contra Costa County Supervisor, but Candace Anderson is a former mayor and council member in the town of Danville. Candace, welcome and happy Thank Friday. You. Well, happy Friday to you also, and absolutely, my time on the Danville Town Council is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> well, awesome. So as usual, this, by the way, is my last um, Town Talks for the year as, as mayor. Uh, next Tuesday, um, we will be um, uh, selecting a new mayor and a um, vice mayor, along with swearing in two council members, um, Karen Stepper and Robert Storr, as the election season is over. And we're delighted and hope that you can join us on Tuesday. And if you can't, you can always watch it um, on television. And there's an announcement on our site about all the dates. But with that, this is the 12th video. Um, so this is a little short 90 or 82 second video, I think, just to introduce what we're going to talk about. And today is really complex, but important, even though we live here in the town of Danville, as Candace does. But how does how, do, how does county government intersect and overlay, even though we're incorporated versus like Alamo, Diablo and places? And, and we're going to learn about that. And we're going to learn, I think, a lot more than most of us know. And there's no better person than Kansas to do that um, because of her great experience. So with that, I'm going to start off a real quick here. Get this going. And there we go. <laughs> That last list there was rolling by fast, but that really <laughs> is a long list. And maybe I can start off by, um, you know, when we think about local government, um, most people first think of cities because that's how they generally associate themselves. And, and as I said, even though in the town of Danville, San Ramon, we're incorporated, which means our borders are a separate legal entity. And while services are provided mainly by that incorporated areas as the town of Danville, there's a lot of crossover services and the county has that role, but not necessarily do all ordinances that the county pass oversect on, on each incorporated area. But the, the principal function of a city is to provide those local services. So it's parks, planning, generally policing, public works, things like that and sometimes fire. As you know, here we have a joint fire district, but it's a standalone entity. And it makes a financial sense sometimes for cities that aren't as large to be able to afford to do that. But there are 482 cities, 58 counties, and Contra Costa is one of our older counties and has had a, an incredible history. And it's a, um, a role that even I, 32 years ago, getting involved in local government, I'll be honest, I didn't understand what it does. But in one sense, the county has an enormous responsibility to provide all social services. They have to have a county hospital. They have to have a sheriff's. They run the elections. They have a county seat. They're the property tax collector. All of those functions 
that towns don't do. We don't have any of those functions per se. And even our elections, while we have a city clerk, elections are actually run by the county government. And I'm gonna read one thing and then ask Candace, gonna ask you to kind of jump in and tell us about all of the things that um, county government does and we could spend hours talking about it, but as you saw on that <laughs> list, it's going to be hard. But the principal county functions include general government, protections of persons, property, health, sanitation, roads, bridges, recreation, welfare, and corrections, and land use planning. Wow. That sounds similar, except there's a lot of those things that we don't do. So, Candace, I'm really delighted that you're here. And on behalf of everybody that lives in the town of Danville, and, and I think I could speak freely for those that live in uh, your supervisorial district, District 2. Thank you for your service, your leadership, your integrity. A job that I don't know if all of us realize that it's seven days a week, it's 24 oh, it hours a day. <laughs> it is. Really. Candace, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Noel. And if it's okay, I'll share my screen. Although yes. in your short video, I think you covered it all. We're uh, even, nobody knows. Place. You and I know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more. And I think you did. You started us out so well showing um, really the county where we've got 19 cities in Contra Costa County. Every 10 years after the census, we divide it up evenly. So District 2, which over which I'm the supervisor, is Danville, San Ramon, Lafayette, Moraga, and Orinda, and part of Walnut Creek are the incorporated areas that we have. And then, as you mentioned, we have about a $4.4 billion budget in the video, and most of it really kind of goes to the health sanitation services. And yeah, so... I'm just going to interrupt you there. I, I want to note to people, so that's $4.4 billion that in 72 hours, your county spends our entire budget in the town of Danville, approximately $35 million, just to give people a sense of scale. Well, and, and Danville is one of the most efficient cities, towns in the county with keeping their expenses very, very low. You have an amazing town council that does an excellent job of really managing your tax dollars because most cannot run a city per capita as efficiently as Danville does. But, and I note, yeah. I note there too that um, when you look at financial statements like this, this high level, it's noteworthy that the debt service for Contra Costa County is 1%. Yeah. That's actually really low. That we, speaks well to both the management and the way that capital and things are done. Excellent we, job. We have a very good bond rating and we are very um, careful not to spend money we don't have. And that was certainly a hallmark of my time on Danville's town council as yes. well. So as Newell mentioned, cities in Contra Casa, especially Danville and the cities up here that I represent, really do an amazing job providing their citizen services. And these are your, your planning, your land use, your parks, recreation, transportation, police services. And then I get to do that with my fellow board of supervisors, boards, for the county, so for unincorporated community like Alamo, like Black Hawk, like Diablo. And so we get to provide that planning, land use, parks, recreation, transportation services. But what we do have is we have a great partnership. And so this list is where we work together as equal partners, um, the Association of Bay Area Governments that handles land use planning, that we're what's called a COG, that we're assigned certain responsibilities such as our arena numbers um, from the state. We have in the San Ramon Valley something very unique called our Citizen Corps Council Emergency Preparedness Organization. And that is made up of San Ramon, Danville, the school district, San Ramon Valley Fire, and the county. Um, county Connection, Robert Storr sits on the County Connection Board with me as we work on ways to make our transit system in Central County and South County a little more efficient. Um, Newell sits on the Contra Costa Transportation Authority. I'm an alternate on that. And that's where our cities work together with the county to really make efficient transportation decisions, priorities of how we spend money, how we leverage the tax dollars that we get through Measure J to come up with really good projects. Um, East Bay Regional Communication System, and I've got a meeting with that later today, and that's how we, in Alameda County and Contra Costa, how our first responders can communicate in a disaster or in regular police matters when they need to communicate on the same radio wavelength. The MTC, Metropolitan Transportation Commission, is a regional body that allocates transportation dollars and transit dollars. Uh, Recycle Smart, Noel and I both sit on that. And that's where we come up with the most efficient way and the most sustainable way to handle 
solid waste, your garbage? How do we divert it from the landfill? How do we better recycle and reuse what we have in our homes? We have the Southwest Area Transportation Committee, which is a sort of a subcommittee of the Transportation Authority that really focuses on transportation issues and funding specifically for both the San Ramon Valley and the La Mirinda area. Street Smarts, our amazing traffic safety program we have in the San Ramon Valley. Traffics, which is our traffic mitigation program, the yellow school buses that go to some of our school sites that are most impacted by traffic. And then the Tri-Valley Transportation Council, which is regional with Alameda County, where there's a developer impact fee collected, and each city and the county get to decide how they're going to use that money. So those are just some of those. And I don't know, Noel, if you want to come up, comment on these partnerships where we work together on these things. Yeah, I, I was going to say it's really interesting. I don't think there are six um, items on there that relate to transportation. And, and just a little background, um, and, and we're you know, in government, we we have a tendency, and I appreciate Candace, you not using the uh, acronyms, but there's one called eBRICS, which is the East Bay yeah. Regional Communication System. But there, there was the first ERAF back in 93, 94 here in the state of California. And what that was the educational realignment alignment funding formula formula. And really what it was, it it was the forward effect of Prop 13. Um, that was passed in 1978 and how it changed the whole tax system um, in the state of California. And there were patches and things that were put together to hold it together. And it came to a crashing confluence at that time. And what people don't realize, one of the outcomes, it was one, first of all, to help protect schools and make sure that our children still had teachers and classrooms. But what it did is it really took the state of California and Caltrans, our Department of Transportation, out of the business of building roads. And just a couple of years before that, um, self-help agencies had saw this coming and started to develop their own. We in Contra Costa County had fortunately started a few years before that, um, creating um, Contra Costa Transportation Authority. And so the reason that you see so much of the interface now is because of that effect. And the long-term effect is, is we have to fund and pay for, even on Highway 680, the widening, all of those things are paid by us as lo local taxpayer, but we're well positioned. And if generally, if we spend a million dollars, we get an additional three million from either state funding, grants, and federal, and we've been successful. But it's our responsibility. So while local government used to be simpler, every year something changes, and it's the necessity that these things. Um, you know, why are we in the traffic's business? Um, as you said, Candace, that's our congestion relief um, traffic mitigation because school districts had to drop um, busing and busing technically, I think it's for most school districts is only provided for um, uh, disabled students and, and, and children in need um, transportation and they get funding for that. They get zero funding. So if a school district wanted to provide buses, they'd have to take it out of classroom money. So we were fortunate, and, and Candace, you were around when we did this, voted, and our, our um, local voters here saw the value of trying to help do that. And when we passed what was called Measure J that we're currently working on with CCTA, the Transportation Authority, it funded that. And Candace, you were one of the original people who sat on that to help create that. And it's really been an amazing program. But I look at this going, if you went back 30 years ago, there was only two of those items that were probably really strong. And the other ones have all been things, you know, our communication system, that was self-help. We, the county, everybody got together. So yeah, the intersection is um, extraordinary. And thank goodness, Candace, you came from a background of knowing almost every single one of those and were part of it. Yeah, fortunately, I had served on most of these as a council member, so <laughs> right. it, was a, it was a very smooth transition from that standpoint. But now we're going to take a deeper dive into some of the things that we had no involvement um, in as a town, as a city. And so these are some general government services. And so as Newell mentioned, you've got sort of the public safety, you have the health and general government. And so, you know, agriculture department, I just always assumed agriculture was managing crops, you know, tallying up the crops. Right. 
Well, it's important because it handles pesticide permits. So even this beautiful ranch land we have because of our hillside ordinance in Danville that's leased out to ranchers, People who use a lot of pesticides have to have specific permits to make sure that they're following appropriate um, methodologies. Weights and measures. Look at the next time you fill up the pump, you'll see a seal on it from Contra Costa County. They're making sure that the fuel is what it says it is and that it's being pumped out properly. They go ahead and go to stores and make sure scales are what they, right. they are. They calibrate them. They make sure that the price that's on the side when you go to Target and you pull an item off the shelf and it says this is going to be $3.99 that when you ring it up at the cash register that matches. And so that's our ag department does that. Assessor, as you know, that's the person who decides how much your property has gone up. Thanks to Prop 13, it doesn't go up too much each year. And we have an auditor controller who then collects, um, after the money has been collected, allocates it back to the town for their share of the property taxes. As Noel mentioned previously, our clerk recorder just ran an amazing election. We have a new um, new elections clerk recorder over elections, um, yeah. Kristen Connolly. And we will also, though, um, clerk recorder also does your vital documents. So that's your birth certificates, your marriage licenses and certificates, your death certificates are all out of the clerk recorder's office and your recordation of deeds and other documents going with the land. And so they have a very important role. And we're going to talk a little bit more about libraries. We have a countywide library system. And then the treasure tax cluster collector, Rusty, Rusty Watts. And you can see we've got a tax bill there. Make sure you get them paid by December 10th so you don't right. have a penalty. <laughs> No and penalties. Then, yep. No penalties. And then we've got what we call the safety net services. And this was one where when I sat on the town council, I did not fully understand the breadth of our safety net services. I just sort of assumed the state did that or the federal government did that. They do, but it's through the county. And so we have aging and adult services, which includes adult protective services, our council on aging, we're doing an aging plan right now, CalFresh, which is food stamps. And I will note with CalFresh, you know, we sort of assume, hey, we live in Danville, everyone's doing okay. Post pandemic, when we looked at the numbers of people in my district, which again, La Mirinda City, San Ramon Valley, we increased 85% wow. of the biggest jump in any district. Now, admittedly, we started with a lower number, but so many people during the pandemic did need this actual additional support through CalFresh. It, it, you apply for it. If you qualify, it's kind of like a credit card that you can go use right. at a store. It's not pulling off coupons or something else. CalWorks to help people find jobs, get back to work. Children and Family Services, which can be everything from child support, um, ensuring that parents are getting the support that a court has ordered for their parent. They actually collect that money and um, dole it out. They can collect it through somebody's paycheck. Um, they help families in that way. And Child Protective Services are foster care and adoption services, which is really a, such a wonderful opportunity. I know a lot of families yeah. in the San Ramon Valley have done that. Um, homeless and Housing Services, comes here, but it also comes into our health department. And I'll talk about that when we get there. Medi-Cal is the affordable health care that's available to certain people. Our veteran services comes under here. And we are so fortunate in Danville. We had the best model that um, when, when I was on the town council, the, the town negotiated with the county to buy our existing veterans building for $1. And then we went through a wonderful process that Newell and I both sat on of redesigning our veterans hall. So when you drive by people, it still looks like the original veterans hall, but it is so much more beautiful. And through there, we have a full veteran service office in Martinez, but they come out to our veterans building um, once a week to work with veterans to help them get the benefits they're entitled to. Workforce services, we have a workforce development board, and then we really focus on a zero tolerance for domestic violence. So these are safety net services. And I don't know if you want to touch on any of yeah. those before. Candace, what do you think? A couple of things, high level. This to me is one of the most complex areas, and those are just the highlights. There's there's many, probably many hundreds of programs. What what is the percentage of your budget you think that goes to the safety net? 
Oh, that's probably well over a third. And, you know, when yeah. you look at sort of the health and human services that makes up half of our budget, it, it's well over a third. So many people are in need and yeah. um, not through any fault of their own. When you no. look at how expensive it is to live in our community and the income you need to even rent an apartment. And when I say our community, I mean the whole Contra Costa County there is a need for support. We, we don't want people going to bed hungry at night. And we have great nonprofit partners like the Food Bank of um, Contra Costa and Solano County. Yeah, and you pointed out too, Candace, that rise of almost 85% of those yeah. um, needing assistance under CalFresh. And you know it's a EBT card, so it's like a debit card um, that works at our farmer's market. Yeah. And I, you know, the council, as you recall, we stand next to the head of the farmer's market, the market manager, and they take those cards there and they give them cash, essentially what they call market money. And um, it is surprising to see, but it's also wonderful that there is that safety net. And they're not people who are, are somebody that um, has necessarily done anything wrong. It's the circumstances during COVID. And we saw this during the Great Recession. People got laid off. And after they've exhausted their own personal resources, trying to hold things together, um, these are those services that help. And, you know, we've we've all had, sadly, friends to, oh, I, I had six friends that were here in Danville that passed away due to COVID. And, and a couple of them were younger, and they had family. Mm -hmm. And so some of these services come out. You can have a single parent who had children. And all of a sudden, they're going to go, if they're under 18, they're going to go in the foster care system until a family member or somebody else can help out. And the homelessness and the housing services, affordable housing, um, just extraordinary things that touches all of us. But yet, we're incorporated. So these are those overlap services. And, you know, I, I, I say we should be proud that Contra Costa, you know, it, you help ring the bell to say, hey, we have issues here in this part of the county in La Remenda, La Miranda, even though you know that the cost of housing and things make it look like, yeah, well, live here takes a, a, a high income, but not everybody is as successful and have those unseen circumstances. And finally, veteran services. Um, while we bought it for a dollar, we did write a check, by the way, Candace, for $250,000, I think. We end up doing that. Yeah, but we only spent, I think at the time, eight and a half million dollars, if I'm not mistaken, right. to restore the building as beautifully as we did. And, and Newell and I were both very, very focused on ensuring that we kept the historic um, portion yes. of the building and the beautiful windows and other things. But yes. And made but, sure we had the veterans offices. So they have offices on the upstairs and if I'm in there once or twice a week and you'll hear them up there with folks. Yeah. And, you know, it's really exciting now we're seeing, you know, like my son who's in his thirties, who served, you're seeing some of the younger folks now come in for services and things like that. Absolutely. Really amazing. So important. Yes. So no, this is, so it's a really exciting part of, of the services that the county provides. Um, something too, I will note is what we find is many of our seniors who are in fixed incomes in high inflationary times often get priced out of their housing as well. And so it's a, it's a challenge. So then we have Contra Costa Health Services. And wow. this is a huge area that makes up also a large chunk of our budget. And one of the primary things that I focused on really is our behavioral and mental health services. And behavioral also includes alcohol and other drugs where oftentimes those go hand in hand where someone may have a mental illness and they try to self-medicate through substances. We have 10 county um, Contra Costa health clinics. We have a Contra Costa health plan, CCHP, that's much like um, a, a health net or some other health plan that utilizes not only our county clinics and county hospital, but also other providers throughout the entire county. We uh, oversee emergency medical services. And so that's where we ensure that each of our fire districts, and that includes San Ramon Valley Fire, Moraga Orinda Fire, Contra Costa Fire Protection District, 
is a separate fire district, but the Board of Supervisors happens to be the board for it. So there's a little bit of an overlap. Yeah. We're held to these same EMS standards as well to make sure that we have a, a common standard of care, how quickly there will be a response time to an emergency, response time to the hospital, the level of care that will prov be provided. And there are some taxes that have been passed to enhance that. Um, environmental health. Now, this is the one that um, puts the green, yellow, or red markers on your restaurants. So right, you important. That. It's an important one. <laughs> you you want to? You never want to go in. Well, you won't go in if it's red. Yellow, you want to <laughs> be a little cautious. And and they also do things like regulate swimming pools and um, school cafeterias. So they're an important area. Hazardous materials, we have that separate from Contra Costa Fire. San Ramon Valley has their own hazmat team, but they will often bring in our hazardous materials in Contra Costa to assist them. As many of you know, we have three refineries in Contra Costa County. And so responding to, for example, Thanksgiving Eve in Martinez, Martinez um, Petroleum, formerly Shell, had something that happened in one of their units and they had not only smoke trickling down but metal particulates that were ending up wow. out there and so things like that where they've got to make sure that things are on the up and up that people are healthy we do it through the sheriff's office have a community warning system that should alert neighborhoods when something like that happens um then the health housing and homeless and that's our what we call h Three, And that's where we intersect with our um, other support services, because there is such a need to ensure people are healthy, that they have housing and homelessness so that we have transition plans. And I will note here, the best way when you see someone homeless or you know someone approaching homelessness is to call 211, our Contra Costa Crisis Center. We contract with them to help direct and navigate people. And I will say at the beginning, or you can call my office, at the beginning of the year, I'm going to be assigned my own District 2 navigator that will help anyone oh, in our great. district who is in the need of services. And then we've got public health. And public health um, is very engaged in things. We, we saw a lot of it, of course, during the pandemic, oh, but, uh, getting information out with AIDS and with needle exchanges, with ensuring that we build housing even in areas where they're not going to be subject to a lot of air pollution. You don't want to build neighborhoods right on a freeway if it if in fact they're not going to be able to breathe clean air. And then I just point out that we've got the regional medical center. This is the county hospital in Martinez, which is also the site of our psych emergency. So if someone is um, taken by police um, and because they're in a psych emergency, they will go to our county hospital where we have a special psych emergency wing. And then as I mentioned, we've got 10 clinics spread about the county, not down in district two, the majority of the people in our district tend to be self-insured, but we do now have more contracted physicians out here. So if someone is on our CCHP plan or receives um, Medi-Cal services, they can see doctors in their own community. And Candace, you know, this is this list has been unbelievably extensive. And each one of those have um, incredible amount of depth to them. But starting with the top one, their mental health services. You know, we've all saw in the pandemic kind of the pandemic revealed an exposure to mental health issues that I think weren't in the forefront of all of our minds, but were revealed because of the stresses and the at home and the lack of contact. We saw it in our children. Absolutely. But it's also raised the awareness to the point that there's some really exciting programs that are coming out that are very successful. And maybe you can share particularly on the mental health on that rapid response team that you have now I'm gonna and jump, how we're I'm all looking. I'm going to jump right down to that because I do have a slide. Oh, you're going to do that. Okay. Yeah. Great. So I'll just jump to that right now. Okay. Well, this was a, a plan that we all came together, the cities, police, um, mental health professionals, council members came together right in the middle of the pandemic and went through a very elaborate process to come up with what we call the A3 program. Right. And it's an alternative to police responding to individuals experiencing a mental health crisis. And so it's called anyone, anywhere, anytime. It really, and um, we have the Miles Hall Community Crisis Hub. So someone can call 911, they could call 211, a family member could call. That call will be directed to the Miles Hall Community Crisis Hub. 
Miles Hall was a wonderful young man who suffered from a serious mental illness. His family moved to Walnut Creek when he was a teenager. His parents did everything they could have done right. They introduced him to police. They introduced him to the neighbors. He said, this is our son. He has a mental health issue. We want to avoid there ever being um, a, a horrible situation. Unfortunately, one evening, um, Miles Hall was in a, in a serious episode. He had a, a metal pole. He was threatening family members. They called 911. Walda Creek police came. They tried to use non-lethal methods to stop him as he was coming at them with this weapon. And unfortunately, they shot him. He died. And it was a tragedy on so many levels that we weren't able to help him before we got to that point. And so from there, it, traditionally, if someone um, was going to be 5150 is the police um, police code for when you're taking someone okay. in for a, a mental health crisis, you would just take them straight to psych emergency. You would have them evaluated. Sometimes they'd be out in less than 24 hours. Sometimes they'd be out um, within 72 hours. Occasionally, you'd get a two-week hold. But the whole criterion for holding someone is, do they pose a threat to themselves or to others? And oftentimes, someone with a serious mental illness can present very, very well, kind of talk them, talk their way out of it. And so this then says, well, let's have someone different respond. Does it always have to be a police officer? Right. Very often, you'll still need them in the background because if there's violence, you don't want to um, have any clinician, social worker, mental health professional put in danger. But the dispatchers who are trained can decide what level of team should we be sending? And would it be level one, level two, level three? Maybe firefighters, paramedics, maybe police would be the, the first that would be sent out to the 911. And then it's coming up with alternative places to go. You don't always have to go to a hospital. You don't have to go to psych emergency. Could you go to a crisis center? Could you go to a sobering center, a peer respite where you would have other people who have experienced mental health challenges who can sort of talk you through it? What are the other destinations? And so we've launched it last year. It's expanding, it's growing. We're very, very excited about this. Yeah. And it truly was a collaborative effort. And I will say thanks to the voters who passed Measure X, the half cent sales tax in 2020, we were able to fund it with $20 million ongoing and an additional um, allocation, about $15 million to get it set up. That's great. And, you know, parallel to that and, in, in, um, you know, really the emphasis for that and even local events, that San Juan Valley Fire here um, stepped up, uh, Chief Paige Meyer and his team, to figure out, yes, can we do that, that different type of response and so they they have been going through the process of a pilot program, retraining the dispatchers, retraining all of their first responders, and also working with uh, the city of San, uh, San Ramon, their police department, to retrain police officers. We're doing the same thing that the county is, obviously, our police officers or your sheriff's officers. But to do that, and all of these programs to get to that confluence of how to respond appropriately in the nature of the call. And I think it's it's just wonderful results that we're starting to see. People say, well, why didn't we just do it right away? Well, it, you know, it does take training. And, and what's important is to know how to develop de-escalation skills. Well, we can talk about it, learning those, understanding them, having enough experience of how to go through that takes time. And so, you know, I think fortunate that we haven't had any other incidents and that this in the long run is, is going to save lives and have better outcomes. It will. And it also goes to sort of the, the next thing that has been a big focus of mine is how do we help the mentally ill who cycle over and over right. and over again through our jails? And so there's a national movement through our National Association of Counties called the Stepping Up Initiative, something that I got our county involved in many years ago when, and when I was about four years into my term as a county supervisor. And so what we have done is we have expanded several programs. We have something called Laura's Law, which is an assisted outpatient right. treatment for someone who has a diagnosed serious mental illness, has been hospitalized or incarcerated because of their mental illness more than twice in the last two years, who needs treatment but is refusing treatment. And so through this AOT program that the governor just signed right. in 
to have all counties participate before it was optional. We were ahead of the game. We are then able to provide some very, very extensive outpatient treatment. And then if someone still declines, we can bring them before a judge who can order their treatment. We've also expanded our mental health treatment in our jails. We're spending um, over $40 million a year inside our jail on expanded mental health treatment. We've reconfigured our Martinez detention facility, and we are building a new wing out in our West County detention facility in Richmond that will have even more supportive services for those who are mentally ill. Now it's great to treat someone while they're in jail and that's not my preference. My preference is right. treat, treat them before they get into jail, but then it's what do you do when they leave? And that's where you've got to have the appropriate supportive housing and the supportive services to ensure that they are going to continue with whatever treatment plan it is where we don't just have them cycling through. Yeah, Candace, this is this is incredibly important. And again, I think all of us are so proud that Contra Costa and your efforts to be able to get these things started. And it's it's incredibly expensive. As, as, as we're talking about, you're you're spending your burn rate of cash per day is about $15 million. Um, but it takes a lot to um get um, these programs and what we don't want to see, and we've seen it in the past, that these come and go like they last for six months because they're six months funding. You and, and your colleagues have found sustaining ways. Measure X is helping that. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing um, the fruits of that effort um, to make sure that these programs stay here because it takes time. Um, it really does. As much as, you know, those of us that say, gee, I'm okay. And if I fall or something and I get hurt, you know, I go to the hospital, I get fixed, I go to physical therapy. Well, that has a beginning and end that's a much shorter period of time. And through mental health, there's underlying issues, there's environmental issues. There's so many things that it does take time. And, and I know sometimes taxpayers are impatient about it. But what's impressive here at the county level is that you're trying these new ideas that show real success. And there's legacy programs that that have starting to vanish because they've been around forever and they're not changing anything. And so it's hard to do that because it means you're changing jobs, you're changing relationships, but um, well done to be able to change and pivot to find new solutions. Well, thank you. And, and now I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about our, our justice partners and where we have law and justice. That's one of those things also that the county gets to provide. And so under our law and justice sheet of paper here. <laughs> You've got animal services. You have what's called conflict defense. That's when the public defender has a conflict because there might be two defendants charged with the same crime and they both um, have different bases for their defense. So we have a conflict defense panel, the district attorney. We have probation that not only, I think a lot of us recognize that probation is sort of like parole where you have someone who's let out of jail and they've got to check in with a probation officer. What a lot of people don't know is that our juvenile adjudication, and I'm sorry, I see the seal covered that, um, that also comes under probation. That doesn't come so much under the district attorney's office, although they, they are partners with that. Right. Public defender and then the sheriff who both not only does law and justice issues, but he does the, the coroner, figures out the cause of death in our county jails. And I was gonna jump down to talk a little bit about animal services. That's a that's a big deal for a lot of us. That's one of the few services. And we contract with you for that service. You do. We, you, we yeah. don't have it. It's really important and we really appreciate it. Yeah, and it is. It's it, We just raised the rate, which was a little controversial, yep. to now $6.79 per capita. That's what Danville and all of our other cities are paying. And it is one of the... Field services, Antioch, it costs them closer to $15 per capita. So it's kind of nice that it's not just um, the county gouging the cities, which we really don't do. Um, but these are some of the things. So main priorities, you try to return 
owners their domesticated animals ship your animal if you can so that will make it so much easier we do investigate a lot of complaints of animal bites maybe rabies exposure um, attacks to humans or domestic animals and unfortunately all of us think our pet is exceptional and uh, i you know before my my 14 year old dalmatian the the year he died and and it wasn't because of this I was walking him right outside my house in a little pocket park, and I saw a very well-dressed gentleman um, who had pulled up to the little pocket park with his pit bull, who was off leash. And I walked my dog on a leash across the street to Diablo Vista Park, walked him around, and as I came back, um, the pit bull was still off leash, and I called out to the man. I said, would you please put your dog on leash? My dog is old, a little skittish. And he said, oh, no, he's fine. And as soon as he said that, the pit bull ran across the street. Yeah. Oh. jumped on my dog, you know, stuck his his jaws right into the hind legs of my Dalmatian. And it was just, and the man came running over, could not control his dog, finally did. And he just said, I'm so sorry. He always listens to me. Yeah, right. They're, they're animals, okay? Keep your dog on a leash. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder, park. Candace. Yeah. You know, people think because we have a dog park where you can't take your dog off the leash. You can't do it just because you live in Danville and places and it feels safe, it's really just for that circumstance. Yeah. And it's always that story, by the way, that somebody says, well, I thought they would do that. The leash law there is to protect you, protect us and our neighbors. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. No, no, I'll throw that. Yeah. And so then you do have, you know, laws that do govern potentially dangerous and dangerous animals. If you have a dog that's biting other dogs, you will be required to have a fully enclosed area for your dog. You'll have to have a muzzle on your dog. There are lots of rules that they do enforce for that. Um, we respond during regular business hours to police or fire department calls for assistance regarding animal related issues. We don't do wild animals. That is really the state of California's fish and game. And so if you see an injured coyote or an injured deer, sadly, animal services is not going to be the one to respond, but state fish and game will. And then we do um, investigate animals and we do adopt out animals. And so we are having, we're having a special <laughs> right. right. free adoptions through December 11th. I threw wow. that in there. But it's, and it's the, the one funny thing that I had to push for Years ago, a couple of years ago, when costs got high and we didn't have the staffing, they stopped picking up large dead animals on someone's private property. So if you back up to open space and you ended up with a dead deer in your backyard and you called up animal services and said, I've got a dead deer in my backyard, they would tell you two things, hire someone to do it or drag it to the curb and then we'll pick it up. And mm -hmm. we have since, um, where every city's paying a little bit more, we will remove dead deer from your back thank you thank you and, <laughs> and to think about it for that cost as much as nobody likes to see costs go up it's because the cost went up and the nexus to that was also about changing some services Improving provide it. a little higher level of services and for the town of danville it's about a three hundred thousand dollar cost and if you think about it that would barely be a person plus some equipment and that there's no way we could do that so um, it's a very cost effective solution for most of us. And I think there's only what, one, maybe two cities that don't only, use that. Only, yeah, only Antioch is the only there city in the county that does their own. We've we've invited them to join us. There's been a grand jury report last year that suggested they consolidate, but they they like doing it their own way. And that's yeah. we respect that. Thank well, you for this. Well, and then you've got our criminal justice. And so we've got Sheriff David Livingston, who is one of our Danville residents, um, does a fabulous job. We have our district attorney, Diana Becton. And I'm really impressed by our chief probation officer, Issa Eamon Krause. As I mentioned, she is the one who focuses on juvenile issues. And something that she is really working on is we have two juvenile facilities, or we did. We had the Orrin Allen Youth Facility, also known as the Byron Boys Ranch, out in Byron. And then what you're seeing an aerial photo of, photo of below is our juvenile facility in Martinez. And so she said the Orrin Allen Ranch is costing us $6 million a year to run. It's We only have about 12 youth in there right now. It's only for boys. She said we could provide the same programs that we're providing out there to these low-level youth offenders, but in their own homes, in their own communities. 
And so we're closing the Byron Boys Ranch and we're opening up what she's calling the Briones Academy that has three tiers. And so the first tier is for the lower level offenders that really can be back in their communities. They can receive counseling with their families, strengthen their families back in school, in their own community, receiving intensive services they might have received out at the ranch, but in their own homes. Now, something that we look at as we reimagine youth justice is why is it that in the San Ramon Valley and La Mirinda, very seldom do our youth end up in juvenile hall? It's not because we just have good kids. I can tell you that as the mother of four sons, there, <laughs> there were moments where I said, what were you thinking? Um, <laughs> but the reality is that we have a close relationship with our police who very often will either have our youth enter a diversion program right. or they will come up with an alternative way to track those youth so they don't end up in juvenile hall. And so we're looking countywide because there is sadly a disproportionate number of youth of color in juvenile hall and where the African-American population is just about 10% of all of Contra Costa County, typically more than half of the youth in juvenile hall are African American, and it's not. I always say it's not just because we have, um, you know, ra racist police or district attorneys or juvenile. It, it's really, you know, what are we doing to support those youth from birth to really help them through that? The second tier in juvenile hall is going to be one where they will continue to get more privileges, more of a, a college type campus, bringing in um, the trades to help them learn, meaning the trade unions, to help them learn skills as apprentices. We have education provided by the County Office of Education, and that's gonna be really important. And then the third tier, um, the juveniles, the state juvenile justice program, they are realigning as they often do, and they are sending us back the highest level offenders who typically have been sent to the state juvenile facility because of rape or robbery or violent deaths, you know, things of that nature. And so they're going to be kept separate from the other youth, but it's really a fun way that we are looking at how can we better handle our youth? How do we help them really look at preventive measures? So one of the things I sit on is called our Juvenile Justice Oversight Council, where we look at the money we have and how, what can we do to partner with other nonprofits, other community-based organizations who are making a difference. Candace, I think you've highlighted some really excellent things. You know, we we worry with some of the popular past propositions that change criminal justice at the adult level. But the greatest success that we can have as a society is to help our youth. And, and we also know by age and mental um, awareness and things that you can be most effective at the youth age. So these programs that you're mentioning are really really the solutions that we need and it's more just as importantly they have really great results and we used to just um, throw all these young offenders into the same group there are those hardened criminals that were taught and were part of an adult criminal organization or something and you have these low-level offenders that they would intersect those were not good decisions so I, I you know i really applaud what you're doing and the leadership at the county level and, and the results are really getting positive. And the diversion programs, like you said here in the San Juan Valley, you know, if to a, to a parent here in Danville, if your child does something like that and the police department will sit down with you, make sure everybody understands. And the option for diversion is that both the parents and the child will participate. If the parent doesn't want to, that child is going to go to a different solution. And so I think it's that combination of getting the family unit back together um, through diversion. And in the absence of a family and other circumstances, that there are those people in these outside advocates that can help be that person to advocate for that child and help guide them through. But um, well done on getting different results using different standards and great solutions. Well, we've got, like I said, fabulous chief probation officer. And then I, here, here's one that hit close to home for, <laughs> yep. for Danville. And as most people know, our sheriff's department provides police services for a fabulous Danville police department. And so um, city manager gets to choose your police chief with input from the town council. And I got to sit on a few interview panels when we were 
interviewing a couple of our police chiefs when I was on the council, but three cities still utilize the sheriff's department as their police department. So it's Danville, Lafayette, and Orinda. And so this year we went through sort of a, a Re readjustment where we really had to look at liability costs, just like all of you carry insurance. Many of you have an umbrella policy for un unfortunate incidents that happen, maybe not in your home or um, not in your automobile. We do have liability costs associated with each of our deputies that work in Danville, work in San Ramon, um, and excuse me, not San Ramon, Lafayette and Orinda. San Ramon used to be a contract city years ago, but they formed their own district, um, their own fire, excuse me, police department later. So this is something where we were looking at a huge, huge jump where last year Danville was paying um, for our current fiscal year 77,000 in liability cost per deputy. And then, or in total, not per deputy. Right. And yep. then that would be really expensive. But yeah. in total, based on thirty full time um, deputies, and then it was going to jump to two hundred and seventy three thousand. You know, a, <clears throat> almost two hundred thousand dollars. And so we, at the board of supervisors, I, I very strongly advocated, at the very least, <laughs> um, let's not split up deputies based on those who work in the jail and those that are out patrolling on the street because very often they cross um, back and forth where someone who's assigned to the jail may be on a given day say, no, nope, we're going to put you on patrol in some of the unincorporated areas. So that lowered costs by about 20%. And then I also really advocated for phasing it in over a three-year period, which isn't great, but it's it at least gives our very small budgets is you know as Newell mentioned, Danville has what are you about 30, 36 million right now? Yeah, right. yeah. It's 36 million dollars, but this is a big hit. And Lafayette and Arinda have even smaller budgets. So that's one of those challenges. On the other hand, I'm a big fan of the contract method, and I'll let Newell talk about what he sees as the benefit of contracting with the sheriff's department. Well, and, and you know, Kansas, what you bring up on this, and we do appreciate your advocacy, is, you know, we want to make sure as a community that we get the highest level of services with the best officers available. And in turn, we want to make sure we pay our fair share of the cost. And you know, there's reallocations that are done every so many years. We've done ourselves our own studies. And, um, you know, I think this came out fair. Um, and what it really says is that it doesn't make any difference where the, the liability, if there is a sheriff's department and whether they work for us or they work for the county, it's a, it's a shared responsibility. But the, the value proposition that we get out of this is that, as you said, that that the officers, they wear, they drive Danville cars, they have Danville uniforms, and they act accordingly in this community to the standards that we feel are appropriate in how to uphold the law and how to really focus on behavioral change. So, you know, we always tell people, if you're going to get a ticket here, you have to 50-50 chance. When they stop you <laughs> and they say, um, do you know why I'm stopping you? And you say, you're just bothering me. I'm, I'm busy. Why don't you go get the real criminals? And they'll they'll ask you then driver's license and your insurance. And, and the idea of getting a ticket um, for a moving violation is to change your behavior. And in Danville, we've plotted over the past 25 years that when you look at when we increase the number of citations, accidents go down. And it's the exact inverse. And when you see those two curves, it is so compelling speeding speeding or running red lights are what cause accidents but the quality of the officers that we get is what what keeps us so um, linked and committed to having um, this relationship with the county and um you know it's just coincidental that the sheriff happens to live here because the other sheriffs didn't <laughs> but we've always had that level of service Mm -hmm. And we are very proud of our officers um, and the new group of officers that have come through. They come with different types of training, a different attitude. Um, we have a lot more women. We had the first female um, police chief, Christine, back in the 90s um, that was oh, here. 
who I saw Thursday night at a retirement, uh -huh. Wednesday night at a retirement party for my colleague. And Christine, oh, this is her Danville day. She just looks back yeah. on this as the best place to be. Yeah, so a great relationship. And thank you for the advocacy. And But also thank you for advocating that it's still a good for both the sheriff's department. Absolutely. It's good for um, local city um, and our response times. And as you know, when there are incidents and stuff, the backup resources we have, we have the sheriff's department that will back us up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a small city, if you had 30 officers, that's your backup. Yeah, um, you know, most it, cities don't have a helicopter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it's really a great relationship. Which, which actually, you. you know, people think, well, what do you need a helicopter for? But when we had a very serious um, armed robbery of one of our residents at Trader Joe's um, a few months ago with his watch stolen, the sheriff's department had the helicopters. They were out capturing suspects but let's talk seven hours bit. later by the way yeah. we didn't announce it for a while they yeah. wanted to make sure we had everything but yeah seven hours later um have that person in custody they did and well and so superior courts even so even though they say superior court of contra costa we don't really get to control the courts we do have our sheriff deputies in as the bailiffs in the court and as security in the courts because they are escorting our our inmates back and forth the state oversees them and probably the biggest question we get is about jury information and it can be really frustrating and confusing when you try to get a hold of them if you're having trouble trying to contact the jury information person at this number give my office a call we we do have a contact there that we do reach out to we fit this week alone we had a very sad story of an elderly man whose wife was in the hospital he was called to jury duty. He couldn't get through to anyone. Right. And, and, you know, instances like that, We're, we are here to help. <laughs> we want to help you with, with things like that. So that's, that's definitely something that we would like to do. And then I, I'd love to talk a little bit about our library. We have a beautiful library. And Newell, tell us about the library in Danville, how it came to be. And you were an integral part of that. Well, I happened to be on, I wasn't technically on the council while we were planning it. I was on the council once it was completed, but it was a, um, if you remember our old library, it's it's uh, uh, about a block away from here. It's uh, um, right next to the Crossroads Shopping Center. It's now a mortuary. We sold it because we had the opportunity um, and it was actually kind of came up as an opportunity that we didn't know about. The school district had the old Charlottewood School on where the um, our current library and community center is. They also owned the property behind there where there was a housing project and they were moving the school and been planned for many years. And they kind of got stuck. So the town was able to step in, help facilitate some land use changes, and in turn, an opportunity for Danville to acquire in our, right in the heart of our downtown, a, an opportunity for a town green, a community center, and a library. And most people don't know this, that most of the libraries in the past 30, 40 years are actually built by the local jurisdiction, but it's actually run by you, Candace. It is. County. We run the library system, and people don't know that. But, right. but imagine if you had to have your own collection of books and maintain them all, and you didn't have access. That's the, the beauty of this library system is you get to design one that fits in your community, you maintain it to your own standards, and then we provide the employees within the library, um, all the books, the circulation, the online, anyone who relies on audiobooks or Kindle, electronic reading, ebooks. We have one of the best collections. If you go to cccLibrary.org, you just need a library card, and those are very easy to get. And the cities are also able to provide supplemental funding for additional hours beyond the base hours. And libraries, interestingly, are funded by a very small portion of your property tax. And so they're not funded through the general fund, just through this very small amount of everybody's property tax. And years before I became a county supervisor, um, city council member Amy Worth, who's now retiring from Orinda City Council, was part of a coalition that tried to push a tax measure to just increase slightly the tax for our libraries. Unfortunately, it failed by a very, very small margin. And so we really do rely on our cities to increase the hours 
One of the challenges we face, like so many businesses, though, is hiring. There are not enough people who want to come work in our libraries. And so that has also limited our ability to expand services and hours. And we are now, through Measure X, funding a foundation countywide that will help our libraries overall, um, and particularly some of our more disadvantaged communities that do not have. Um, Newell serves on our library foundation. I used to serve on our library foundation. And then we have an amazing Friends of the Danville Library that also raise money. All of those things are just so helpful to have the quality library that we have today. A great partnership. Candace, we're down to the last two minutes. I like I said, we could spend another couple of hours. We could just talk all morning, yes. <laughs> you are so busy. And I tell you what, I don't envy, you know, our council meetings um, are twice a month and they could be two hours to four or five hours. You have them almost every Tuesday and they could be eight or nine hours long. We, we went from 9 a.m. to 4.30 on, wow, on Tuesday. a long time. Controversial so, land use project. <laughs> So with, with our last minute here, what would be the thing and all the message that you've heard here today and, and, and given out to help inform people, what would you like um, constituents here to be calling your office for? What would be to say, hey, call us because we can help you with what? what any, any, any county service, anytime, whether it be a property tax question, an assessment issue, um, the ones I like best are when you find someone in need. And Fortunately, a lot of people reach out to us when they um, know of, I just last month, I had several people who said, I have a friend who's going through a divorce. Her husband has locked down the bank accounts. The children are with the mom. They don't know where they're going to live. They don't know where they're going to, how they're going to feed. We're here to help with things like that. And we have emergency services that will assist with that. Anytime you have a question, obviously, if you're, um, in some of the adjacent communities that are unincorporated, we're, we're here for you, but we'd love to get you involved too. There are a lot of county commissions yes. and boards that aren't just for unincorporated people, but they're for everyone who lives in our county who cares about the health and human services, who cares about mental health services. So we are we're really here to, to help you with all of those issues and i have lovely staff that will answer the phone and get you the information you need or direct you to the department you need candace thank you so much and it i think what the the takeaway today is not only the comprehensiveness of all the services um, but it really is again about that partnership and about the cross overs that we we have both in senior um, services um, in transportation planning, in regional planning, in our communication systems, um, as we heard about today, animal um, services, health services. Um, it's a partnership that wouldn't work with all of us. So Candace, thank you to you and your staff. On behalf of the town of Danville, thank you, thank you for your high integrity, your level of service and your commitment. And I hope you get some time off. I you work so seven too. days a week at this. Um, <laughs> But we really appreciate everything you My do. My pleasure. Thank you All so right. much. Have Hopefully. a great weekend, folks. And next next month, you're going to be hearing from the new mayor of Danville. And I'm not going to tell you who that might be um, because we technically have to vote on it. You but do we have a prediction. <laughs> we have a prediction. And you're going to have to listen in next Tuesday. Please join us at the Village Theater um for the um annual mayor's installation and community awards ceremony with that happy holidays merry christmas happy hanukkah thanks candace thank you bye-bye bye-bye